to be continued. A warm and heartfelt greeting to each and every one of you. I hope you are all having a wonderful day and feeling great. Today I will be giving you a basic presentation about the project, specifically about airships. Pavel Filipov will not be here today, but he will return to us next Tuesday. Please write in the comments if everything is visible and audible and if everything is in order. I see the chat. Cool. Today there will be some additional detailed, fundamental and essential information about the project every Tuesday. As usual, we will explain in detail why airships and why we chose this particular project and the reasons behind it. Explain in detail where the investor's money will go, specifically what will be done and implemented with this money and thoroughly explain how it will be carefully and precisely used. Today I will talk about this topic in great detail and with examples. Let's start from the very beginning and cover all aspects. We started on time today and many people were not ready for it, which was quite unexpected and surprising. I will talk about airships in general terms, why we chose them and provide an overview of why we chose them and what they are exactly. I'll start from afar, naturally of course. Three years ago we first met Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin. He is currently an academician and in the past a brilliant creator of flying machines. He created a total of four of them. He was the director of a company that dealt with imported aerostats. Naturally he made money from this. It was with this money that he built his enterprises. We met him approximately three years ago. For what specific reason did we meet? I have been working at Solar Group for a long time, for many years carefully selecting projects and thoroughly evaluating technology. Firstly, technological advancement, science intensity, readiness level, team readiness, and so on. And whether I like it or not, I still occasionally wonder what would be so cool. Public funding so that the technology is excellent, the implementation worldwide is vast, and it is feasible and somehow all the arrows pointed to the airship, and we were not yet acquainted with Kirillin at that time. I have read many analytical reports on the overall direction of various industries, including aviation, transportation, logistics, and many others, and so on. And everywhere there was a need for something like an airship, something that could transport large cargoes, albeit not at high speeds, without the need for airfields, with vertical takeoffs. Many countries were already starting to develop this technology. Three, 
even four years ago in various regions and applications. The Chinese were actively developing it. The English were trying to revive their tear lender. And the Germans were, of course, working on it. And then it hit me. Let's look at what an airship is and how it works. Like many others in this project, in this chat, I started Googling, watching videos, reading websites and articles. It turned out that many people are interested in this, but no one understands where these airships went, why they are so impressive in their technical characteristics, and why they should be and were used before, and their future prospects. In general, there is a very lively interest, and it's unclear where it comes from or what its nature is. People like airships, and this fact can be quickly Googled. You open YouTube, type in airships, and see how many videos there are, how many questions about where they went, how many comments saying, let's bring them back. And all this led to the idea that we should try to find someone who is working on this. And as it turned out, our country has one of the strongest schools of airship designers who have already built a large number of airships in modern Russia. The machines were built for specific tasks. They were made, fulfilled their tasks, and were sold, not only within our country. For example, one device was sold to Thailand. In Thailand, there is a monarchy, or whatever the correct term is, basically. There is a king, and in honor of the king, some painting was applied to this airship. We love our king. And even such an airship, actually built in Russia, flew in Thailand. I don't know his fate, but it turned out that we have an engineering team in our country capable of doing this. But what was done before with Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin and Avgur seems to be somewhat like the past of airships. The same applies to what the Germans are doing now. It is also based on developments from the past. And people are asking about modernity, like where are the modern airships? Where are the super high-tech airships with cool designs, great comfort, super modern technologies, eco-friendly, economical, and so on? And after meeting Alexander Kirillin, I realized that the old school uh, is still important and necessary because firstly, they have already done this and they know all the principles on which this thing works. As Kirillin says, it is an incredibly complex breathing mechanism, and for it to consistently perform all its functions, even just to stay in the air, one even needs to know an infinite number of nuances. How to supply these gases here, extract them from here, add air there, turn on the electric motors and manage all the weight distribution. In general, the details are important, and the old school knows all the nuances, but the demand from the world is still for modern airships. And this is also very easy to Google. When you search for modern airships, incredibly beautiful renders come up, created by many artists, depicting how they would like airships to look in the future. And there, well, look, there are indeed some incredible air palaces, various shapes, both horizontal, and vertical, some resembling fish, and there are golden ones with feathers, all kinds of them. This is what creative designers are sketching, and I would really, really like to see such extremely fascinating innovations soaring in the atmosphere. There is a very real requirement for this. The Chinese are conceptualizing a lot, including upright flying workspaces, this is what they are sketching, and there is a very real requirement for it. Engineering groups around the world are already gathered and are commencing to collaborate on manufacturing design in conjunction with aerospace specialists who guarantee the real flight. They are not just fantasizing like designers, but are already doing industrial design together with engineers. There, such beautiful things don't work out anymore because, as usual, we wanted something very beautiful like this. But what you can do with the airship school is indeed bad, 
and everyone still refers to old forms and old appearances and so on. And now we have this opportunity, which is why we took on this airship project. Firstly, because there is a huge demand among the population of the entire planet. Everyone wants to see airships. Everyone wants to see them super modern. We are so lucky that Russia is a dynamically developing young organism and we have very uh, cool ideas from the design side right now. I'll get back to the design now. We have an old school that understands how to do all this to make it fly. As for cool designs and other exciting and interesting things, we traveled around the world. Quite a lot of conferences and so on have been held in various countries regarding the previous project, or rather the current one, on Duyunov's engines. And indeed, returning to Moscow, you still walk around and realize how far Moscow has come in terms of comfort. You come to a restaurant, and it is a restaurant, but it is far from being European. It has long since leaped ahead. This includes the ergonomics of the space itself, its external appearance and the organization of services and other aspects such as you come to a new residential complex see how they are arranged and realize they have advanced significantly and it turns out that a young school of designers architects and engineers has emerged in our country who are ready to move forward yes china is moving very far ahead that's clear it's hard to keep up with their machines and by the way they are also making airships. But again, the first airship they made was a complete copy of the AU-30, which was precisely made by the engineering team on whose basis we are building this project. That is, they did not immediately start designing it. Initially, they tried to make something that had already flown, and fortunately, they succeeded. In general, I am confident that the Chinese will also strive to create beautiful things, beautiful designer machines, modern airships of the new generation in the near future. But there is one problem. The Chinese are good at copying, and it is difficult for them to invent independently. With a 99% probability, we will still be the first in modern airships. Based on this old school, we are now forming a design team with incredibly talented, highly skilled and experienced, powerful industrial designers. We are involving really great industry professionals, as our institutes actually produce very strong industrial designers who excellently design cars, yachts and airplanes. But it's not just about drawing, it's about industrial design. Specialists from both MAI and NAMI, as well as from other institutes, are indeed in high demand worldwide. And they often go abroad because in our country, the situation with the automotive industry and aviation is quite clear. And overall, it is generally difficult to find a job. This group, or rather a crowd of young people eager to do something great generally exists. There is a leader. We talked with a great industrial designer. He is also Russian, worked in big companies, worked with Citroen, worked with Volvo, worked with the Chinese. Those main cool designs that make Chinese cars look great, it's all his handiwork. He worked as a manager in all these companies for many years. Now he has returned to our country. And when we talked, he said that it was really possible to design an insanely cool machine. I said, it is possible. He said, guys, I've designed everything, but I haven't done an airship yet, so I'm in with you. And when all the pieces of the puzzle come together, and these are, after all, the engineers responsible for making this thing fly, everything will be tested in aerodynamic models. All the mathematical tools have already been created to calculate how it all works. In terms of efficiency, energy capacity and other matters. All models are available. Calculation methods are in place and top designers are on board. There is a request regarding production. And once the final issue with production was resolved, 
we realized that everything was really coming together for us to launch it. It turned out to be quite exciting. Because there is a great industrialist and production specialist, Ruslan. His real mission is to create and launch factories. He has already established several of them, both with attracted funds and some he funded himself. Recently he had a project and now it is operational, having reached the necessary volumes. Ruslan is an aviator by nature. They were involved in the production of engines for airplanes and helicopters, and they made small light helicopters and autogyros, and they also made airplanes. But all of this was his hobby, and while he was engaged in this hobby, he was simultaneously building factories for the production of fish processing conveyors, a factory for producing some kind of bacterial fertilizer. These were small factories, 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 and he was simultaneously involved in aviation. When we went to Ruslan and asked, Ruslan, can you ensure the serial production of airships? We have designers, develop all the designs. These designers also have the technology, Yao. They will explain the main components and other details, how the whole process works as they see it. Ruslan said, wow, airships are really cool. I'm all for it. And since Ruslan spoke, there is a very thin layer of highly skilled and remarkable manufacturers, creative designers and technical engineers who are involved in aviation in the country. And everyone knows Ruslan because if there was a problem related to aviation, even many state orders for the development of an aviation engine would go to him. Some institute is taking on this government contract. The institute is looking for someone to do it. The person who will do it is being sought by someone else. It's the usual scheme. In the end, everything leads back to Ruslan. Ruslan was ordered to develop the rotor or its production through some intermediaries. He worked on developing the shaft, developing the body. Overall, he assembled the entire engine, produced it, tested it, distributed all the parts and everything finally flowed back to the top. In general, everyone in aviation knows Ruslan. And when he said he would be working on airships, well, everyone is still calling. Ruslan tells me that his phone has never been so busy. Everyone wants to work. Everyone wants to build airships. Everyone is offering their help from calculators to ordinary machinists. Everyone says, wow, cool, let's go fly airships. And when all these pieces came together, it turned out that everything needed to make this happen was in place. Sergei Semenov created a chat, and most likely, it is through this chat and this activity that you have come here. Understood indeed, there are people from the current project from Duyunov's engine at the airships. But that's obvious. The audience is huge and will include not only people from the current project, but also those who are simply interested in airships. Because, let me repeat once again, watch any video on YouTube about airships. There's a channel about their creation. I saw this video yesterday. It's been there for several years, already three years. Just open the comments and read what's going on there. Every other person is saying, wow, we need this. Sergei Semyonov from Zolchat launched the project. And now I will tell you in this webinar where this project will go in the coming years. If the presentation is visible, it should have been visible several times already. These are the technical aspects. Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin has 3D models of the airships. You can view all of them on the website aoaerostatica.com. This site can be found directly through pinned messages in the chat, on Telegram, and in the pre-launch. It is the very top, the very first message. Check out how these airships look there. We just ran them through a neural network to change their appearance. In general, the fact that there are some additional engines here that look slightly off, well, sorry, we just quickly got rid of the Sirius Russia inscriptions. Although the inscriptions were fine, we just need to work on the design. In general, this is the current appearance of the airships, and two are shown here for now. Below is a stratospheric airship, and precisely above it is a 40-ton tourist version. It has two levels with balconies and so on, etc. In general, I will explain how we will get there. For now, I can say that uh, the stratosphere and tourism are also mentioned here currently. 
The stratosphere is an absolutely immense market, and one might wonder what airships have to do with the stratosphere. It turns out that it is indeed possible to reach the stratosphere using the very same Archimedean force that allows airships to fly, and it is necessary to ascend there. The stratosphere is not fully occupied. People have mastered the air. We fly here on helicopters, airplanes, everything imaginable, on paragliders, parachutes, and even just fall in free fall. But the stratosphere is unoccupied. Space is occupied. So it turns out there is a layer that is not occupied. And there are many opportunities for solving specifically commercial tasks, such as providing communication, internet, and remote sensing of the Earth. In general, a lot of tasks that are specifically commercial, not counting those romantic ones, which indeed easily attract investments worldwide. This is to ascend to the stratosphere oneself. To lift a small capsule there, like a couple of rooms in some hotel, hover in the stratosphere and look down. This is, well, practically space tourism a bit. And now there are indeed several startups in the world that claim they will achieve this in the near future. It's actually not difficult to do, and Alexander Nikolaevich wouldn't want us to be involved in this, but uh, to be honest, I'm personally interested in taking an airship up to the stratosphere. It's, it's some kind of madness. Of course, first there will be unmanned options with various technical means for earth sensing, communication, and other purposes. But if we already have something going up there, why not go up ourselves and take a ride? This is the stratosphere. There are definitely countless tasks. The romance is wild, but how we will achieve all this, I will start explaining now. What is being created with investors' money? with crowd investment money. Let's first talk about why crowd investment, why big players are not investing, why state corporations and so on are not investing. It cannot be said that there are no investments. Alexander Nikolaevich has been knocking on the doors of ministries, knocking on the doors of corporations, and he finally reached Rostec. Rostec had fully agreed to implement the project and this was several years ago, about four years ago. They said, yes, Alexander Nikolaevich, you are very impressive. The developments are great. The engineering team and the design and scientific team you are providing are completely satisfactory to us. Let's go ahead and build airships. The business plan was approved. The project roadmap was agreed upon and work had already begun. And how did COVID-19 happen by chance? So Rostec had already taken Kirillin under its financing. COVID-19 happened, and with a stroke of a pen, almost all of Rostec's investment directions were crossed out at the zero stage, like the stage with Kirillin. Why is the stage zero? Let me explain. For the same reason, neither state funds nor other corporations particularly want to get involved in this story, because Yes, there are a few enthusiasts who run around, well, run around, sorry, knocking on big office doors and saying, indeed, we are actually capable of developing cool airships, performing a list of very important tasks, both commercial and governmental in general, and it's all profitable and so on. In fact, indeed. Let's get started. Their first question is, where is your design bureau? Where is your engineering team? Please show that you are already sitting and working. They say, here is my engineering team. Everything is in place. Although this one works at a space enterprise, this one works at a defense enterprise, and this one works at a third one. Give me the money. I'll gather them and we'll get started. So there was this initial stage and only Rostec agreed to it, but then bam, COVID-19 hit and they cut off Alexander Nikolaevich's funding. They paid him some more money there. He lived on it for a little while longer, and then he eventually fell into our clutches a bit. These engineers are really all working. 
Everyone needs, of course, to feed their family, support themselves, their home, and other things. Well, everyday expenses. Kirillin is running around looking for money. And everyone says, well, once you find it, so we will all come together. And we, yes, about all coming together, it's not all that simple either. It turned out to be easy and simple to count the airship specialists in the country of ours. If you count the top specialists, there are about 2030 who are really exceptionally top-notch and highly skilled guys who used to launch all this and now strongly advocate and support for it to continue. Among them, there are a number of management teams and you can identify three primary and key groups. All the others are essentially engineers, scientists and so on, who each claim their group as their own. Each group says, this is mine. And the others say, please kindly, we will build airships however you want. Just someone come up with the funding and manage all these processes. And so it happened that while preparing for the project, we inadvertently managed everything ourselves. We have found both production and designers. And of course, we have a personal account, this financial structure, the platform itself, through which there is an opportunity to attract funds. And so everything came together, including the design bureau. And the first thing now is to bring all these people together under one roof, under one legal entity. And it will be a joint legal entity between our newly established company. More precisely, it will be a newly established company that will include the collective investor Solar Group, also holding 49% as in the current project. And it will include JSC Aerostatics, which is the legal entity of Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin, other related project implementers. The implementers are the Moscow Aviation Institute, which has a design bureau with a large workforce. This design bureau launches and certifies airplanes and other aviation equipment, and they will fully participate in the project. All agreements with them are fully in place. Additionally, we have an experimental production facility where they made their first Aorus vehicles, and they are fully ready to use the same facility for this project. I have read the documents regarding the agreements between aerostatics and use, detailing the various parts of the work we will handle. This includes not only the interior seats and exterior design, but also various transmissions, numerous components, the fuel system, the power unit, and the gasoline engine. I will provide more details later. The main implementers and a collective investor will be part of this legal entity. This legal entity will lease premises where all, so to speak, the luminaries of airship construction will be located, plus the linear scientific and technical personnel, in general, just designers, calculators, and scientific staff. And so it will appear, so to speak, the first stage. We will no longer be at a new stage. The fact that we are all united, we all have a clear and understandable technical specification, hierarchy, and thus an organism and mechanism will emerge, capable of implementing this project. This is what is being created through crowd investments. And this is what didn't work out, so to speak, and generally doesn't work out not only with the airship. At these initial stages, many technologies are in limbo, and we reviewed and selected all of them. Further, the land is needed so that, obviously, designers can design in broad industry cooperation. All of this will be produced, modeled, tested, and so on. In this case, regarding production, I will say a bit later, there is no need to build a factory. All the factories already exist and are functioning. Our task is only to provide clear technical specifications, receive the components and assemblies, and put everything together. And to bring all this together, we need land in order to successfully achieve this goal. 
and here we are now at a managerial crossroads. The first step is to buy the land, and then there's a fork in the road. What specific land do you want to buy? You can buy 150, 200 hectares of agricultural land, and gradually and painfully convert it into industrial land, bring all the roads, electricity and gas to it, level the site because this is an aero project, an aero town, everything should be flat without bumps, pits and potholes. In general, this is one thing about the purchase and another thing about the purchase. There are many offers to buy a ready-made aerograd. We accumulate them all from various regions, from Moscow and Smolensk and from the south of Russia. People call and say, here is an operational aerograd. Everything is already in order. The land is registered with all the permits. We took over some Soviet heritage. It has been with us for a while. And now it is an overhead expense for us. If you are planning to build something grandiose, why start from scratch? Take our ready-made one. On one hand, it is great to take a ready-made aerograd and it will be fully owned, which means the investor's money is well protected because it is property, it is land, it won't go anywhere, and it will only increase in value as various facilities start to be built on it. And these are the shipyards that I will talk about now. But there is currently a second option available, not to buy this land, and not even to rent it. We are receiving calls about coming to us. We have a huge aerotropolis with 500 hectares of land on the city's master plan. Let's collaborate together. Come to us directly for co-founding. Build whatever you want. We will help you with everything, including administrative work. There is indeed a lot of work with the administration. If you want to build a facility at Aerograd, well, everyone understands that it's not just about constructing an industrial facility. Everyone involved in the current project knows how much various permits are needed, and anything related to aviation is even more complicated. And here, in general, they are offering something like this. Join us in a partnership, and in my opinion, this is the coolest option to partner with people who already have land. It turns out that if we enter into a partnership, it already becomes partially ours. And here are the saved funds. We don't need to buy land and spend money. We can simply take a good partner and immediately, roughly speaking, start building, spending money on construction. This way we save both time and money naturally. And this option is the most prioritized. We are moving in this direction and will most likely get there because the trend is positive. We will sign all the contracts and they can be made public and discussed in general terms for investors' money, more precisely for crowd investments. Naturally, besides the investors' money, we will also have land ownership, where we will be obliged to build two hangars, and therefore this all adds to the project's cost. The two hangars include the first hangar for a small airship. Talking about the stratosphere, the stratosphere is in the sixth position. That is, if you arrange the airships from the very first to the stratospheric one. Well, naturally, there are more beyond that. Here is the sixth one. Initially, everything is gradual. A small device will be built there in two types, which I will talk about later. Then a bigger device, then an even bigger one, and only then a bit further from the atmosphere. For each device, for each type of device, a separate hangar needs to be built because they are all different. A hangar is like a garage, like an assembly shop, a place where components, motors, gondolas, shells, and a lot of other things from all industry sectors will be brought together. And in the hangar, the final assembly of the device will take place. And so, for each type, a specific hangar is needed. And in the project, we have included the construction of two hangars for the first type of apparatus, and for the second type, respectively. The production is indicated here. 
and I mentioned that there is no need to build factories as such. All necessary factories already exist, and everything can be produced through broad cooperation. This saves us time and money in the initial stage. However, the production of certain critical components, mechanisms, and the same shells must be kept under our control by our company. It is critical in the sense that if you tell everyone everything, then someone else could make an agreement through the same cooperation and start doing the same thing without you. We need to retain the critical technologies, mainly the technological processes for ourselves. And these technologies exist, the processes themselves exist, the understanding is there, the designs are there, everything is there. It is simply necessary to establish this production in order to establish and set up production. Part of it will be established inside the hangars, and part will be moved to relatively small areas that can be rented nearby in close proximity to the same aerodrome. This will happen a little bit later on in the process, and the areas are extremely small, around 300 square meters in total, simply to have a couple of mechanical sections perform some essential work in these sections. This is not the construction of a factory at all, but it is the production of highly critical technologies and innovations, resulting in intellectual property. This company will not only handle design, but also technology. It is clear that with all the industry institutes involved in the transfer, it will be like our company ordering development from the same entity. It is understood that this intellectual property development will belong to us, but they will be the ones developing it. And this is no secret, at least for them. It is precisely the production part of critically important technologies that will be our secret. It will be our absolutely guaranteed intellectual property. Apart from various patents, know-how and so on, it's good to come up with something, but it's difficult to produce it with quality, inexpensively and in series. And this is what we are committed to. Additionally, a school is being established, a school for pilots, and there will also be one for technicians to service the airships and to fly them as well as to maintain them. We need personnel. I don't know exactly how many specific positions there are, but it's a lot. Just imagine you arrive at the airfield, oh well, yes, there in Domodedovo, in Sheremetyevo. And how many employees are actually there? Starting from the entrance, there are employees, registration desks, information desk employees, so many employees that we don't even see, they are running around somewhere. Dispatchers who are coordinating all of this. Customs, of course, are separate services here, a separate entity altogether. But when you get to the runway, someone is loading the luggage, someone is de-icing the plane. It is handled by a bunch of technicians, not to mention the pilots who are sitting in the plane this is a very heavy and large infrastructure for airplanes. For airships, it is significantly smaller, but still, the personnel are different. They are needed, and they all must have diplomas, certificates, and work permits. To achieve all this, a school is necessary. The school is a physical one where they will sit, well, obviously, where they will all be taught, and so on. The school will also operate on a commercial basis, teaching people from outside, but I don't really want to. I actually meant to say the most interesting thing is that the airship school doesn't in fact require any supernatural methods. Laws and so on, all of this exists. If you wanted to open a pilot school, it is possible to open a private pilot school for private pilots. You would take the documents and regulatory documentation according to which you would do this, and read that there are schools for airplanes, helicopters, and airships. They do not actually exist at the moment, but all the documentation is immediately directed towards airships, so there are no administrative problems. Methodologically, yes, there are. The training methods for an airplane and an airship are completely different methods. But in modern Russia, as I have already mentioned, they did fly. They flew quite a lot in various structures, including private, 
public, private and military. And everywhere these pilots and technicians were trained. In other words, there is experience. In recent years, there is an understanding of what needs to be done now, and this school is essential for us to get everything started. Therefore, yes, it will be created, and it is in the plans. There are specialists who have taken on this task. If you watched our big conference, Sergei spoke and said that he sees no problems. Let's train the pilots faster. By the way, there was a question in the chat about whether there are simulators, like for airplanes and helicopters, if there are simulators for airships. The answer is yes, there are simulators, but they were all created for those airships that existed back then, meaning they had all the old instruments and avionics. So there is a simulator, but it is outdated. New ones will be created. No problem. What is being created and developed? External business projects are listed here with additional details. Let me explain. A parent company is essentially being created, or how else to explain it, in essence, a stable business unit, a commercial techno business unit, in other words. This is a design bureau with Incredibly cool guys who design airships and produce them on a very large scale. This is a land with two hangars where these airships are assembled. This is a kind of secret production which, using critical technologies, creates all these things. This school of pilots and technicians results in one hangar and another hangar, and they can already start serial production, naturally after flight tests and certification obtaining a type certificate. They can then produce them serially, and this becomes a fundamental unsinkable business unit that can achieve self-sufficiency and further development through its own commercialization. That means there will be enough for dividends and for development. And now about external business projects. This is about the fact that this parent corporation is, from a legal standpoint, the same legal entity, half owned by a group of investors, and everything that will be built further, including other types of aerial vehicles and storage facilities, will of course belong to this company and consequently to the crowd investor. But let's imagine a situation, which is likely to happen, where a large client comes and says, I need aerial vehicles. You are doing a great job building these small ones, but can you start building this particular type of aerial vehicle for me right now? I need it for a particular assignment. I see that you are serious. With the design office already working and manufacturing underway, and you are building storage facilities. I have confidence in you. Please create this aerial vehicle for me, which is not yet in your product lineup. Here are the funds. Naturally, this money already includes some built-in financial gain, and this financial gain almost immediately becomes a shareholder dividend. Why not? And this is exactly about these external commercial ventures. While the parent corporation is being established with the crowd investor's money, significant capital can come from the outside we ensure that the financial gain from these funds also profits the investor because the crowd investor is fundamentally at the initial phase and is, in a way, the originator of this project. We, on the other hand, are the other originator. So, if significant capital comes into something already established, it is clear that they should belong to the investor in quantitative terms. What does this mean? The investment amount is $100 million. This includes referral fees, no need to multiply it by two, everything is already multiplied here. We need to attract $100 million to organize a design bureau, complete all the land work, and if we enter into a partnership, it would be wonderful, meaning we would even have a small reserve. We need to build hangars, establish a school, 
and construct two types of airships, two units of each type, because one is not enough for flight tests. So two of this type and two of that type, plus organize their own small production and prepare everything for the serial production of these two types of devices. This amount is sufficient, and the implementation period is three to five years. I don't know how to describe it, not optimistic, not pessimistic. In general, the timeline is such that in three years, or even earlier, the first device will already be flying. Of course, it will be small at first, then a larger one. Oh. It is quite likely that a small unmanned version will be flying in a year to a year and a half. I am saying this at my own risk, of course, but the likelihood of it is very high. And so, three to five years, taking into account that we will be completing the construction, putting these hangars into operation, naturally building these airships there, first testing all the ground tests of the units and assemblies. Then there are flight tests. Flight tests really take a long time. And considering the flight tests already conducted, all the equipment is certified, and we are ready for mass production of these devices. The timeline is from three to five years, so in three, five years, this machine will already be generating profit, not counting the large sums of money that will come in much earlier, and not counting the parallel business projects that we also plan to undertake, which I will talk about a little later. The capitalization is stated to be over a billion dollars. How did we calculate this? There is a standard rough formula, like three annual profits. Pile it up, and that's the capitalization of your company. So, take this thing, divide it by three, and you'll understand what the annual profit will be from the serial production of these two types of devices. The smaller one will be produced at a rate of 12 units, No longer needed, the 10-ton model will be produced up to 25 units. One hangar will be able to produce them serially. More or less divided by their quantity and quality, and it is generally clear what and how. And this is the capitalization according to the most pessimistic estimates. This does not take into account that the airship is something incredibly beautiful, it is super technological, it represents the future, an economic breakthrough, and so on. These are just dry numbers, just produced, sold, made a profit, multiplied by three. But no one has been calculating capitalization like that. Take Uber. It has no profit, yet its capitalization is enormous. Therefore, this is the most modest and extremely inadequate assessment. It will be much cooler there, as soon as the 10-ton airship takes off and especially shortly after the stratospheric ones, everyone will become rich because they will have founded an entire industry that didn't exist before. This industry is both logistical, touristic, technological, and stratospheric. It involves communication and transportation, everything. Watch the video by a popular American blogger I don't remember his name, but he recently released a review about airships. He says he doesn't understand why they aren't around at all, but he understands that everyone has started making them. Look, all these links are in the Telegram chat. We can also duplicate it here so it appears again. For those who haven't seen it, watch it. He compares the cost. Airplanes transport this much cargo for this much money. And in comparison, sea ships transport this much cargo for this much money. And trucks transport even more for different money. He explains almost on his fingers that if you release an airship and its economy has already been roughly calculated and proven, then if you perform all these tasks, this company will be the largest company on the planet by capitalization, with insane turnovers, a new Silk Road, and all the 21st century stuff. And he only touched on logistics, large cargo, and even more, not to mention tourism, the stratosphere, special tasks, 
and many, many other related areas. Here is the perspective. Let me tell you a little bit more about these two devices, what they are. Here, two two-ton machines are specified. That is, two tons is what it can lift. And two approximately ten-ton units. Each of the units will be constructed in several types. And the two-ton model will be the first to be produced under the Aorus brand. It will be a passenger vehicle with six seats, small restroom and a kitchenette. So this is called the gondola, where people will sit and everything will happen. You can still load up to a ton of people, things, water, provisions and other items into it. Aorus. They really want to have a cool airship under their brand. They need it, and we need it too. So, together with them, we are building one like this. Plus, in parallel, the entire air gas system, the engine, and other avionics can also function without this gondola for approximately six people. So, if we remove it, we get another ton there, or even more on top. As a result, in the unmanned version, we get a device that can lift two tons into the air, transport it a couple of thousand kilometers, or hover over a point for a day or more. This is a very cool commercial product. A drone carrying approximately two tons over several thousand kilometers. There are none like that. In general, there are no airships. This is the first device. It is small. The second one, a 10-ton airship, is more serious. Why was this size chosen? From a commercial point of view, it is the most attractive, the most mass-produced helicopter ever released on the planet, is the Russian Mi-8 helicopter. About 15,000 units in various modifications have been produced. They can lift four tons of cargo vertically, just like an airship. An airplane cannot lift vertically. It needs to take off. It can lift four tons of cargo and transport it over a known distance for a known cost, meaning that each kilometer of the journey costs money. This airship will be able to carry twice as much cargo or even more over much greater distances and at a significantly lower cost. All these figures, how much cheaper it can be transported further, you can visit the website of JSC Aerostatics, go to our commercial projects, scroll to the 10-tonner, and there is a comparison table showing who flies on what, how much they spend, and how much more advantageous this device will be. You can find the Overstatic website on Telegram, in our chat, pre-launch, click through the pinned messages, and it will be the very first message. The 10-ton apparatus is mentioned here, like the first 10-ton yacht. It will also be made in several versions, a 10-ton. Tourist, passenger, cargo passenger, and cargo model. Cargo, both piloted and unpiloted, they will all be designed, that is, developed. We will produce two, most likely cargo passenger, but we would also like to have tourist options, probably so that in three to five years we can independently hold a conference there and say, hooray, we did it. However, looking at cargo passenger transport, it wouldn't be bad either. In the tourist version, a gondola appears again. In the cargo version, if there are 10 tons of people, food, water, provisions and other things, then this gondola is not needed. Here, it's 15 tons or even more. In this version, whether cargo, piloted or unmanned, this device will be able to lift. We need to produce two small yachts and two additional 10-ton vessels, as these are prototype samples. They will undergo rigorous and thorough testing, be certified, and therefore, firstly, be ready and prepared for commercial operation or sale. Additionally, based on their model, mass production will be extensively permitted in order to ensure that they are completely ready for the market and public use.
about the land, including two spacious hangars for their serial production assembly, a state-of-the-art school, and the development and production of critical and advanced technologies, plus a growing list of customers for future expansion and innovation. So that's a bit further down the line. Here, customers are meant both for serial production, which I will explain a bit further in this context, and also for the development of specific and specialized devices, in particular, because right now there are already calls and letters, but of course it's all still in progress. It's not solid, but they say, guys, if you can lift an apparatus capable of carrying 10 tons into the air, it will be for tourism and we'll take it right away. That's like, wow, cool. If you can lift 2 tons and transport them 2,000 kilometers, we'll also take it right away. So. There are customers, and not just those who say they'll take it immediately, but also those who are ready for us to design and produce specific apparatuses to meet their needs and fulfill their tasks. So, in this three to five year perspective, all these customers will either be waiting for a serial device on pre-order, or someone will be expecting that we ourselves, for example, performing some work, will provide a service for the 10-ton model meaning we will be doing something for them or we will already be developing something for someone. But the five to ten year perspective, let me tell you a bit about it. We are not going to stop at ten ton models and small yachts. Obviously these are all being made. They are small, not as super futuristic as we would like, but in reality they will be very cool and everyone will be pleasantly surprised. I think by the new year, we will have already formed their technical appearance, taking into account the new design, properly selected materials, and so on. In general, they will look great, but still, it's not quite there yet. Those are the 20 tons, 40 tons, 200 tons, and the stratosphere. And all these projects will be laid out, so to speak, in parallel, progressively parallel, sequentially parallel. Let me explain. Initially, a small yacht begins to be designed. As soon as all processes are initiated and everything is stabilized, the 10-ton unit is also put into operation, albeit with a slight time delay. And then, with perhaps a slightly larger lag, launches will be staggered over time with 20 tons, 40 tons, 200 tons from the troposphere, and so on in parallel. Well, obviously, first we organize one processor. It starts, we check it, it works, then the next process, and so on. Everything will be developed in parallel. It is clear that for the rapid development of subsequent devices, funding, active attention, and other resources are also required. For now, we are focusing on the first two. The remaining four run parallel to the electives, meaning without significant expense. But we keep in mind that we also need to build hangars for them, so we are selecting the land right away. We understand that, roughly speaking, by designing a 10-ton model, we are already working on a small yacht. We will be testing some technologies, processes and other aspects on it for future larger devices. And this is not even the end of the lineup. Just from the perspective of the next 5 to 10 years, there are still these 20 ton, 40 ton, 200 ton and stratospheric vehicles. I can tell you more about them too. 40 tons or even 20 tons actually even 10 tons, but 10 tons is not desirable. At least 20 tons would already mean flights around the globe in comfortable cabins. With stops there in the city center, overall it's such a cool tourist thing and we wouldn't want to dwell on them. Most likely, a couple of 40 ton models will be made just for tourists. We plan to make a couple to carry out their certification and so on, but just recently there was a call from the Arab countries. They were interested in exactly such models. They need a cruise airship, approximately 40 tons, and it will be double deck, with a first floor, a second floor, some space here and there, an exit to the roof, balconies, and so on. They really want such an airship. They asked when they could come over, and we said, wait, wait, we'll set up the design bureau, get everything ready, and then we'll definitely invite you.
So they already want to take it and maybe two vehicles won't be enough. But we would like to jump a bit further and start building bigger things and dealing with the stratosphere. It is clear that everything will proceed in parallel and the stratosphere will likely be reached even earlier than in 10 years. According to estimates, in six years it will be possible to fly into the stratosphere on large airship platforms. If the first vehicle took three years for certification, then the stratosphere vehicle will take five to six years for certification. In 2.5 years, the stratosphere vehicle will be certified in five and a half years, and in six years it will already be operational. It is clear that it is not yet for people, but for commercial load and other purposes. However, events will develop quite rapidly now. I think it will be very cool and interesting to observe all this, to participate in it, in the construction of hangars and the launch of the first vehicles. This is earlier. Something unreal has been added here. An operating company. This company will be commercial, as is customary in aviation. For the development, for every ruble invested, you get approximately 10 rubles. There are many developers of various airplanes in production. In general, for every ruble invested in production, there is a return of 100 rubles. They finally built the airplane, and it is economically viable and flies great, which is valuable. The return on investment is 1,000 rubles for every one ruble invested. It's clear they produced an airplane and sold it, and the one who bought it wants it to pay off multiple times. Naturally, why would he even buy it at all if the main money comes from general operation, and thus an operating company is a logical step in the project's development? We build them ourselves, operate them ourselves, earn money from them ourselves, and naturally sell them. But without our own operation, first of all, we need operational experience, various businesses, and other people who will be interested in airships. That is, I need to tell the guys to build me a park of airships, set up a hangar, train my staff, so that everything can be operated properly. Naturally, we need to operate them ourselves. Therefore, an operating company appears as soon as these vehicles start being produced in series. Clearly, the number of clients is expanding. Here, the money is shown with arrows. These are the clients as I have already mentioned, for the development of specific vehicles, and such clients include Roscosmos. I am talking about it. In fact, there are many of them, but Roscosmos is somehow more understandable to us, even because there are already terms of reference from Roscosmos developed jointly with us. The task is to take rocket blocks, launch vehicles, and transport them from the manufacturing plant to the Cosmodrome. But right now, the logistics are incredibly complex, long, and expensive. This way, it would be fast and cool, and they will order a special vehicle. So, this special board is not about someone ordering a special board with suede seats for themselves, but specifically for fulfilling a narrow task. And for fulfilling such narrow tasks, there are actually very many indeed. Starting with medical ones, roughly speaking, a flying clinic. Currently, we are making a lot of medical trains, medical helicopters, and medical buses. The clinic entirely arrives there in the region. And please, well, there are many special tasks in general, including space, and so on. These are customers who are involved in development, as well as customers who need already produced serial devices for their own needs. This will all be here is the project roadmap, approximately speaking, for the next three to five years. You can take a screenshot and study it in greater detail. But as I have previously mentioned, initially the development of one vehicle starts. Then subsequently, when these processes have settled, the development of the second vehicle starts in parallel with a slight delay. There the mock-up phase commences. Initially, the mock-up phase. Next year, models of these gondolas will be created, which people can visit, walk around, and view and explore in the future. This is a mandatory part in aviation, like in the automotive industry, seen videos, 
First they carve the car out of clay to look at its design. Here, everything will be the same. Then they make a concept cabin just to sit in it. The same will be done here. First for one vehicle, then for the second with a slight delay. Naturally, while this is being done, we are building hangars. First naturally for the first vehicle, and these hangars also need to be designed. There is a technical specification. This is about our company. What should the hangar be like? There is an industry institute that is engaged in the design of these types of structures, and they are involved in the design of these airfields, Sheremetyevo and others, these garages for airplanes. Of course, there must be a special license for designing such things. In general, we provide the technical specifications. They provide the design and we handle the construction. While the models are being designed and developed, documentation for the hangar is also being prepared. Then, after all this has been modeled, firstly, the documentation for the airship hangar has already gone into construction, and something starts to be built. For the first airship, components and assemblies are starting to be produced, including various fuel systems, transmissions, rudders, instrument panels, and a lot of other things. Avionics, and more. And all this will be produced on the ground, tested separately at first, then assembled more and more, tested and tested, and while all this is being done, the hangar should already be completed. And all the tested units should come here and start being assembled into a large apparatus. Simultaneously we have already administratively organized the school, uh, outlined the methodologies, and now, along with the first device, we can start. With its assembly, it will become clear what instruments will be there, how they will be managed, and so on. All methodologies are completed. Here, pilot training can be initiated along with practical operation. It's usual. And when the apparatus started to be assembled here, the construction ceiling was reached, and the second one immediately began to be built. This means that if construction is happening here, then over there, the second vehicle has already been fully modeled, and they are starting. The production of real components and assemblies, as well as their ground tests, is being completed here. This one is taking off, going for certification. This one is starting to be assembled. People are starting to be trained here, naturally. In parallel with all this, the vehicle will not be built until our production of critical technologies is also operational. It will actually function until the first construction of this small hangar, by the way. I can tell you a bit about this first small hangar. It will be more advanced. Until now, all airships docked either to masts, fixed in the field, or wherever, where they would approach, dock, and undergo loading, unloading, or some other process. Or it was a mobile mast where it would be secured. Our vehicles will be the very first, starting from the first one. Of course, there will be mooring devices for masts and other things, but we will do most of the mooring on a special platform. It will land like a dragonfly clinging with its legs. In this position, it will glide through the air. Well, in that case, it will take up even less space because when the device rotates around its axis, it occupies its entire length in radius, creating when it hovers in such a position. It takes up much less space, which is necessary for landing on a rooftop in the city center. This means a mast is not needed. As you have seen, specially equipped helipads are available on the rooftops of buildings. The same will be done for airships. And in the first hangar, such an experimental site will already be created. And on this hangar, both small vehicles produced in this same hangar and vehicles from the neighboring hangar, which will be much larger, will land. However, it will be a standard platform for all vehicles and they will land here. Here, I'll switch this too. You can screenshot and read it. It all ends with the fact that this device came out. Two units were certified. This one came out, was certified, this one started being mass-produced based on pre-orders, this one too, and that's where the project's roadmap ends for these hundred million dollars. And this is the very unsinkable business unit that then starts generating profit and developing. Obviously, for a 
more active development pace for 20, 40, 200 tons of stratosphere and so on. All the profit from this unit can be reinvested to accelerate the pace. Partially this will likely be the case if you allow it, but further investments may be required. We are not saying or thinking that the crowdfunding will end at 100 million. No, in the future, these will just be separate business projects. It's clear that everyone who joined the parent company, all the profit is in the parent company. Everything is clear. Well, then the parent company has everything. It is already operational. And then a business project emerges. The development of a 40-ton airship, the construction of a hangar for it, their serial production and so on. This project costs a certain amount and will bring in a certain amount of profit. The parent company started there by agreement with investors. For example, part of the profit is sent to this business project. Crowd investors separately enter this business project and a large investor might come in and cover half of this business project. Most likely it will be like this and all subsequent business projects will be structured in this way. This business project has its own profitability and the profitability will go to the parent company in part. There are also investors who have only entered there and not here. They will take all this mathematics from here. We will calculate and arrange it so that naturally the main benefit goes to the parent company without any fraud or manipulations. It won't be the case that the parent company has launched some side business project for a major investor and the crowd is not allowed in and the profit goes somewhere else. We are not interested in this at all. Large investors did not want to launch such a project themselves. We launched it with you. Why all of a sudden? We are supposed to grant them some privileges in this format. Here, the slide should be a bit larger, naturally. The team implementing the project? It's not just the team implementing the project. It's several teams. This is Aerostatics JSC, this is NAMI, this is MI, this is the management of this ONOVA. These are the key players. We will reveal this part once everything is finalized, signed and presented in due time and completely. Because movements in shares are actually starting there. Indeed, I can tell you about one such movement. Initially, they were not claiming it. They were offered to take a certain share. But they said, Guys, we will work with you on the first yacht, and maybe on future vehicles too, where our engines, fuel systems, and other components will be installed. We are interested in being co-founders of this company for a small percentage. We thought, well, that's cool, great, guys. Let's go for it, we are in. And when the land movement started, specifically the partnerships, when we found groups of people who agreed to enter into a partnership with us, they provided us with land, administrative resources, and other developments and opportunities, including the pilot school. We were like, please share some people and a percentage with us, it's necessary. They said, no problem. So now this stage is settling down and we will make it all public. Solar Group, 49% goes to the collective investor of this company. Goes is a bad word. We are taking 49% of this company, just like in the current project for profit distribution. Here the profit is unlikely to be distributed in the same way. We are simply taking the co-founding role to make it important, and so on. Naturally, we want to make a profit, in such a way that most of it goes to the investors. Otherwise, what kind of company is it that has investors but no profit? That wouldn't be right. So this slide was supposed to be presented by Pavel Filipov. 
1 billion shares, 500 million shares for investors, 50 billion units. So for those 49%, if in the previous project, well, in the current one, previous current, let's uh, figure it out in general with Uval Mesh. Our shares accumulated spontaneously, so to speak, and we could only understand how many there would be after completing the financing. Here we decided to designate these shares immediately, and hence the math. 50 billion shares, which will later turn into 500 million stocks. In terms of costs, if the market capitalization of this company is approximately $1 billion in the most pessimistic scenario, you can determine how much one share will return. It is generally recommended for you to purchase, but considering the price reduction, since we are currently at the zero stage, naturally the most advantageous price reduction is available. As soon as we move to the first stage, when the design bureau is set up and all the legal frameworks are set up and organized work begins, the zero stage will end and then everyone will see how the price reductions will be distributed. So entering at this stage is the most interesting. However, the industry will grow significantly and entering at any stage will be very advantageous. But as it was decided in solar, at the zero stage with crazy uncertainties, benefits and advantages should be given, if we put it in our conditions, in this scale. Further, it is evident we have a spreadsheet and the hyperlink is in this discussion. You can check it every day to see how much money is coming in. If we compare with... Yes, the link is in the Telegram chat. Look for it there. If you can't find it in the Telegram chat, I'll find it myself. I'll check the contact date. The Airship Generation Group. And a couple of posts back, there is a post about how the project started. And there is a link there. You open it and see all the figures for the current project. The start already has more than $3 million in commitments. And around $300,000 in actual payments. Which is quite remarkable and noteworthy. Compared to the start of previous projects, the dynamics are very good and promising. But if we take into account our current positions, from which we have already started, plus the number of people who are following the airships, and definitely want them to be realized, most likely, the pace will now undoubtedly increase, and should grow. Because lifting such serious vehicles into the air, building hangars within the time frames we plan, all of this is possible. Naturally, in order to ensure that active financing is indeed absolutely needed, I believe we can do it, and everyone can do it. Airships are a very interesting topic. I'll repeat myself. Watch videos on YouTube, read the comments. Many people want to support this cause, and you have the power to make them aware of what is happening right now, to let them know that they currently have the opportunity to help this cause. By actively investing, not just giving money, but also significantly investing in future profits, involvement, the very first important flights, and more conferences on airships. The topic is incredibly crazy. Delve into it thoroughly yourself, let other people know about it, and then we will definitely have the money to completely implement it. The whole puzzle has come together, and now we just absolutely need to finance it. Regarding the marketing plan in general, there is a marketing plan. If you are very interested in it, you can again visit vcontact or telegram and in our groups, find the specific post and read the marketing plan. It is about the fact that if you have a certain structure of partners and investors in our previous or current projects, it will be automatically transferred to this project. However, to activate it, a number of specific actions need to be performed. If your previous or current project does not have a structure and you are building a new structure here, you do not need to implement any marketing plans there. In general, feel free to come in and study if you need to, but I think if you need it, you are already familiar with us.
and have most likely already read all these marketing plans, and maybe even completed them. This is about the starting positions. When the first project was launched, there were no followers at all. The second project had approximately 6,000 active participants currently. Currently, there are 500,000 uh, people at Solar Group who are constantly following the development of Solar Group and starting from this position is much easier. Therefore, we took on a challenging task. And it's not that it becomes easier to relax, but on the contrary, the task is grandiose and everyone needs to make an effort. If you are in the current project and one of the 500,000 who have been following us for a long time, please make sure we definitely know these numbers, because not everyone in the current project is even aware that the next one has launched. If you have acquaintances, call them, write to them, and say, Hey, there's an interesting new development. Are you aware of it or not? Let's help the project get off the ground. How to invest in the project. Everything is still working in the same personal account where the current project is being developed. You can access it via the QR code if you have never been there. There is a separate tab for airships. Go to airships and all the mechanics are the same as they were before. Let's move on. It seems that's all. I will read the questions if you have any questions and answer them. It's not very convenient to read questions on a white background and nothing is being broadcast on YouTube. We should have definitely switched to vContacta. Tell me. Will there be a Club 100 and a Club 1000 in the airship project? And will there be any nice bonuses? I think there will definitely be a chance to be the first to ride the airship. Regarding the clubs, there's also Sergei Shevchenko. Ask him directly. I'm sure some interesting gathering will happen. With the club, it might be an expansion, it was discussed. In general, we had a strategic session at Solar Group where clubs were discussed and certain actions regarding these clubs were outlined. It's better to ask him so that I don't say something incorrect. Is it possible to use helium as a lifting gas and then unload it as cargo flying back on cheaper hydrogen? Yes, in general it is possible. There are developed projects for transporting helium to countries in Asia. Currently in Russia, helium production is rapidly increasing and we are likely to capture this market very successfully in the near future. The question lies in logistics and we have a proposal from our side that is being considered by transport manufacturers to transport everything via airships. As I mentioned, the stratosphere will bring in a lot of money and these airships will also be very profitable. We will share these economic indicators and business plans a little later in about a month to a month and a half and we will provide precise figures. They already have all the data, it just needs to be refined and updated. Regarding helium transportation, there are a certain number of devices with specific load capacities needed for helium transportation and the profit is expected to be enormous, potentially rivaling Gazprom. Transporting helium in dewar vessels will be very interesting and of course highly profitable, leading to an economic boom. Not only is helium itself expensive, but delivering it somewhere also costs a lot and we are saving. On that. In general, our manufacturers are interested in this. This is also one of the tasks that will be addressed in the near future. Uh, we just don't want to talk about it too much yet, but you know, the economics of it are currently being calculated. We will show all the numbers soon. But to deflate the airship and then refill it, for example, with hydrogen and flyback. I think it won't come to that. 
it will continue to fly there either on a helium mixture or on helium with hydrogen. It could potentially be in an unmanned version and use hydrogen, but hydrogen is still highly flammable. Yes, it is not explosive. Hydrogen in large volumes also burns. It does not explode. And we would not want to use it without proving its safety, at least in a phlegmatized state. That is, when hydrogen with certain additives is constantly mixed and does not burn, initially everything will fly on helium. But in the future, it is likely that some hydrogen will still make its way into the state. But it will not be releasing helium. Instead, it will be carrying Dewa vessels and transporting them. This is possible and it is planned. Fyodor, are you currently focused exclusively on the transport project or... Oh, there is an interesting scientific task. We tried to accomplish it with colleagues. Damn. I'm looking at this on vContact, but for some reason, it doesn't fully open this message for me. Last time I went out and checked the comments, these messages were not there, and now they have disappeared here as well. vContact, please improve this functionality. We are not only focused on transport projects, but on others as well. Ivan Sobolev, if you are still here, please write directly in the comments under the video so that I can definitely see the comment on the wall when I come out of here. I will definitely read it and respond. So, in five years, can we really hope for X100 in terms of money? Or at most, X10? In five years, I think we can hope for perhaps X100? Maybe even more. If not more. Definitely. Do you comprehend? There is a question specifically about capitalization. On which market will we achieve this X100 capitalization in the market? How will it be done in the future? Will it be that you invest here and receive X100 from dividends? Maybe not in five years, but eventually directly from dividends? Or will it be from investing and then exiting with shares? Eventually. For this, we will choose naturally a stock exchange carry out all the necessary procedures, take the company public and then the shares will grow. The stocks will skyrocket significantly because any company that currently fills this transport logistics niche, specifically with airships, plus has developments in the stratosphere and can handle loads from two tons to stratospheric levels, will see its stock prices reach incredibly astronomical levels. The question is when we will proceed with this plan, most likely the parent company will first be established as the base, start generating income, and only after that will the profitable company enter the stock market to become extremely desirable, so to speak. Then the stocks will skyrocket, and we will take a portion and distribute them to you, naturally making your stocks incredibly astronomical. We are not even talking about X100 returns, but something much greater. Do you have any interesting and potentially promising projects? Uh, I see. So, how will the airship be protected from a drone with explosives? Such risks should definitely be considered, especially when transporting people. Yes, let me tell you a bit about drones. In general, there are many drone projects, and they come to us for funding and are financed by classical institutions. Everyone can see the speed at which they are developing, both military and non-military sectors, at an incredible rate. Civilians have already seen on the internet how in China and other countries, specialists and builders are using drones to carry cement and lift bags directly to construction sites, even in mountainous areas. Wealthy people are already equipping their mansions and cars with drones that provide anti-drone security in various applications, so, they take off, scan something, land back, and destroy something on approach. And all of this will only develop by leaps and bounds. We have a company with which we are in close contact. It is in Russia. They most likely hold a leading position in drones. They are half military, half private. They very much want to remain private, but the situation is such that they are naturally forced to also address military themes. One of their strongest areas, 
is precisely defense. Protection against kamikaze drones and all sorts of such things Naturally, I want to say not only that, yes, our airship will be protected. In the near future, any large expensive equipment, real estate and other assets will be protected from these drones. These systems will be implemented everywhere and universally. Naturally, on the airship, since it is large, beautiful and we care about it, we will install all these systems. So... If there is a leak or damage to the cylinder, how smoothly will it be able to descend? There are several stories based on real experience. Once a propeller broke a propeller. When our designers were carefully testing the airship, the propeller broke. The propeller was in the ring and it shattered the ring. Part of the ring was punctured, but it also pierced. The envelope and the gas bag. They only noticed this on the second day. They saw that there was a problem with the propeller. They replaced the propeller on the go, reached the hangar, parked in the hangar, and only the next day realized that something was wrong with the airship. The single puncture did not affect its flight characteristics at all. Even machine gun bursts did not always stop airships. They used to fight on them before. One hole could go unnoticed for months. If a large airship is heavy enough and you shoot through it with a pistol, the leaks will be minimal. After a week, you might notice something happened. It is not under pressure, so if you puncture it, it won't pop like a balloon. The pressure inside is similar to atmospheric pressure, and gas exchange happens slowly. In practice, it shows that it won't even descend like that. It will calmly reach its destination and only then will the instruments show what happened. Of course, a machine gun burst from a large caliber weapon will make it fall quickly, but there won't be panic on the ship. The propellers will handle it calmly. But again, this is about some super serious incredible cases when someone decides to shoot at it with a large caliber weapon. We are for a peaceful airship, for peaceful use. If you shoot an airplane, helicopter, car, or even a house with a large caliber weapon, everything will suffer, naturally, the airship too. But it won't fall. Sergei Semyonov used this analogy, and I will use it again. If something goes wrong with an airplane or helicopter, the helicopter will fall like a stone, and the airplane, while losing speed, can glide somewhere. If something happens to the airship, like a puncture, it is like a boat, or rather a large yacht. If a yacht is punctured on the side, its compartments close off, and even if it fills with water, the yacht stays afloat. The same goes for the airship. If two, three, or four compartments are punctured, it will slowly start to sink. It won't go underwater quickly. The airship is multi-sectional. If one section is punctured, it continues without noticing. If two or three sections are punctured, and there is serious damage, it will slowly start to sink, but like a yacht, not like a helicopter or airplane at high speed. It will just slowly descend. So it is clear that all risks must be considered, but the business is promising. It is unlikely that this could ruin anyone's fate. The airship is recognized as the safest form of air transport, everywhere. The latest military, scientific and technical council said, well, the one we had, that out of all aviation, please make us airships. They are indeed the very safest from 30 to 300 tons. They are extremely reliable. There are constant tasks for the military, that is, regular tasks for these machines, and it is emphasized that they are indeed the safest flying transport, so don't worry about safety. I will now absolutely look for more questions, if there are any. I'll check it out on YouTube somewhere, probably in a specific channel or playlist. For now, I've only read it on Vcontacte which is a popular social media platform.
It's better to ask the main technical questions on Fridays, the end of the work week, because that's when we invite the technical specialist in turns, ensuring everyone gets a chance. Last time it was Alexander Nikolaevich, before that it was Dmitry Sergeyevich Kmel. This Friday there will be a new guest, you will get acquainted. It's better to ask technical questions there, but when I say technical questions, they immediately think, well, what kind of technical questions? They immediately imagine everything. And we ask them a question, what will happen if you shoot at an airship? And they go, oh, that kind of technical question, I understand. Although we recently discussed and thoroughly examined blasting, I personally believe that we covered the topic quite comprehensively and in detail. As Kirillin says, we wouldn't even want to delve so deeply into the question because it would give hints to our competitors, but Aside from the fact that we have competitors, we only have colleagues, and if we launch airships worldwide, it will be great. But commercial interest is commercial, naturally. After all, investors' money is important for profit, aside from all this romance. So keep your mouth shut and keep critical technologies to yourself. Legal Protection from Large Capitals, YouTube Absolutely does not want to load at all. So, I have already somewhat addressed this question. How will the company structure look and what will be the ratio of profit distribution among the investors? More than half of the company's total profit will be allocated to the investors. This is our ideological position, principles and beliefs, which we will defend at all these shareholders' meetings. And since we have a large share, indeed all of these will carry weight. In general, this is our position. And how will the profit be distributed among the investors internally? proportionally to their shares. That is, the number of shares you have, naturally the number of your shares determines your profit. When you plan to move to the first stage, I also mentioned that when the work stabilizes, when the design bureau starts functioning, the legal structure is in place, the industry institutes receive orders, and everything is set. In other words, the work has started in a very serious manner, and this will mean that the initial phase is complete. There is a model, it flies, where is the video? In general, the approach is that the next model is slightly larger, flying and reaching the stratosphere. But this engineering team says, we are here to create something more serious and grandiose and don't confuse us with these small things that are all over the internet. Today, someone shared in the chat that a Russian company showed the first unmanned airship, but it's a six-meter toy. We have such toys too. But this is far from an airship, it's a wind toy as it's called. The wind just, well, what kind of unmanned airship is this? We have several various variants of such flying models in terms of both design and payload capacity. It's just also Oh, and we will, of course, demonstrate and show everything meticulously and with thorough explanations. But this team of ours, our dedicated team of highly skilled professionals and experienced engineers, how do you call it? No, not colleagues and not engineers, conservatives. Conservative designers, tough guys, say, why should we show these toys? We are going to build huge devices for serious tasks. Let's not mix us up with this. They are experts in their fields and are committed to excellence and innovation, creating groundbreaking designs and cutting-edge technology for complex challenges and large-scale projects with precision and expertise. We explain to them that everyone is asking where the first flying models are. Show us at least something that flies. They say, well, if it's necessary, of course, we really don't want to. But there you go. By the way, here is a video from Kershuk. The editors there are apparently creating some kind of masterpiece. They promised it almost last Wednesday, then on Saturday, then Sunday, and now today. Take a look. They talked about how they flew.
So there are currently flying models. One airship is currently in a state of being inflated in Kurzach, and the other is in Astrakhan, in Elling. Naturally, it can be inflated and expanded, and with a little work over time, it will rise into the sky and fly. But that's what was done before, so why do it all over again? We need to create modern designs and technologies at the very least. Why bring back the old? There are models, including large flying ones, capable of carrying up to 19 people. But we will spend time, we will spend resources, we will spend effort. But why revive it if you can grow a new and beautiful one? There are not only small airship models, well, not that small, with a payload capacity of 40 kilograms, they are not small at all. The link that was shared today, well, not a link, but a news article, mentioned that in Russia they made an unmanned drone with a 40 kilogram payload, and here at least 40 kilograms. There are also stratospheric probes, of course. There are stratospheric toys that many people launch. You buy a latex weather balloon, inflate it with helium, attach some small equipment with a parachute, and it goes up to the stratosphere. It reaches a certain altitude, the pressure difference bursts the latex balloon, and the equipment descends on a parachute. While it was ascending, it was performing specific tasks, either monitoring the weather, or someone was launching advertising campaigns like, here's my video camera, here's my brand, I went up to the stratosphere, I came down from the stratosphere, and they post all of it. This is really very widespread, and in fact they are just toys that you really don't actually want to get involved with. Indeed. Here is our engineering team. They also have a hobby of launching devices into the stratosphere, but not the disposable ones, rather more serious, controllable ones. So if it's just a latex balloon that bursts after rising for four hours to the altitude it's pulled to, here the devices are made from different materials. These are devices with automation, and they are capable of changing altitude. That is, it can hover somewhere higher without ascending. It can descend somewhere. It can choose where to go based on the wind. It can stay for days or even weeks or even months to perform tasks such as hovering over a specific and designated area or, for instance, orbiting a planet. At this moment in time, we currently have such devices and we are capable of and will launch them. But once again, they are not on the same serious and significant scale as these advanced devices like stratospheric airships because this is truly something the world has never seen before. And this group of conservatives says, why do you need these balloons? Like, yes, we have them, do you want to launch them? We don't want to, but what can we tell you? If you watched the episode with Kirill, Kirill reacted in a rather rude manner, quite rudely, in last Friday's webinar on Friday, answering differently live. I don't know if he was acting but he said that they shouldn't be launched at all to address such questions like whether definitely whether or not model flies and where exactly his video is located. We will definitely launch it and show everything clearly to everyone watching closely. There is already a lot of things that fly around here, but there has never been anything reaching stratosphere on an airship before now. Where exactly did this model come from originally? And where will video eventually end up being shown? The airship will ascend using propellers or some other method. The airship will have near neutral buoyancy everywhere, meaning that when it floats up by itself, that's one situation. When it has neutral buoyancy, you hold it here, and it neither sinks nor floats up. You lift it here, and it neither falls nor floats up. There is negative buoyancy when it still weighs something. If you toss it up, it slowly sinks. If you toss it up, it slowly sinks. The first airships will have negative buoyancy, meaning they will very slowly and gradually, very slowly and gradually sink. It lifts itself a bit more with its propellers, but to prevent it from flying off into space, it will descend smoothly and securely. But it definitely won't be allowed to descend smoothly by the electric motor. There will be a large main engine that will create propulsive force for rapid movement. There will be a relatively small group of stabilization electric workers in number, fully and completely powered by a solar panel, efficiently, 
To prevent it from sinking, it uses electric motors to keep itself afloat. This setup provides it with propulsive speed. And all airships of this cigar-shaped form do not fly strictly parallel to the ground. They fly at a slight angle, like this, but not like this, of course, at an almost imperceptible angle forward. Due to the large surface area being washed by the air, an additional aerodynamic force is generated. And it turns out that it is not so much that its negative buoyancy sinks it, but it even slightly lifts itself up. So, the aerodynamics work, and there are many nuances to how this whole thing rises and how it carries cargo. And for each task, they even choose combinations of different configurations. Both Archimedean aerodynamic and dynamic propellers and ballast-free systems. Up to 40 tons, everything will be ballast-free. Definitely. And each device solves different tasks in completely different ways. We can also achieve positive buoyancy, and it will float to the surface if we need it for some reason. Yes, there will be rotating propellers to provide its lift, and then propulsion speed with negative buoyancy. On different devices, generally everything is different for different tasks, but if we talk specifically about the first ones, they will be lifted by propellers. Yes, they will be lifted by propellers. As I said, it will be lifted by propellers, just to keep it here. If it kind of desires to sink, the electric motors powered by solar panels will prevent it from sinking. And if it is very heavily loaded, they will still manage because this near zero negative buoyancy will be adjusted according to the load. If there is a load, its buoyancy will be such that it wants to descend a bit more than usual. But again, the solar energy prevents this and keeps everything stable without fuel consumption just on pure solar power alone. If it's something extremely heavy needing relocation, then please understand. It can rise on propellers, stabilize aerodynamically and move efficiently. If everything gets turned off while being overloaded, yes, it'll start descending, not exactly sink, but conditionally land post-task completion. Why did we turn everything off then? Any questions, write them down either on vcontact or YouTube. I checked one, now I'll go check another. So, YouTube is lagging, I apologize. Overall, the basic presentation has been conducted. For all technical questions, come on Friday. We will discuss everything, explain everything, and answer all questions. Next Tuesday, I hope Pavel Filipov will go live and provide more details about shares, stocks, and marketing. One moment, also, Please like and share the recordings. It helps the project develop. It's very important. Everyone thinks, I don't know who, but in general, many people are reposting the videos. Thank you very much to those who do. There are quite a lot of views on such long two-hour presentations on vContact, and it's very pleasing. If you haven't done so yet, haven't reposted or shared the broadcasts or recordings, please do so. Know that it really helps the project's development and brings us closer to the first flight of our airship. Like and share the recordings. Call your friends and family and check if they know that such an event is happening. The fact that you can follow it, you can participate in it, Let's gather and build these big, beautiful celestial whales. So I also checked Vicontacte. How long does the certification of an aircraft take? It takes more than a year, but we are planning for less than a year.
the previous type certificate of course we didn't fly we didn't receive it but there was a certificate of airworthiness in general we are planning for less than a year and we will probably do it even faster because there are interested parties not just us but also my team and other industry institutes everyone wants them to fly and the certificate will be issued smoothly can investors purchase a model of the airship with the project's branding I think yes they can if you need merch just write everywhere that you need merch need merch we also need to allocate funds for its production while the project is at the zero stage the financing is not so abundant when the project is already one or two years old then we can count on all sorts of merch if needed of course we will make it I would personally like to have such an airship not an old German one not even clear if it's German but a modern one of ours so here are the technical questions do the transported cargo have any safety parachutes and so on but all the cargo will be different some cargo will be special like rescue cargo if it is valuable they will be equipped accordingly of course if it's a regular truck just a standard one like a semi trailer for example then there will be standard solutions if something is very expensive you can even attach wings and rocket engines but again I repeat airships are still the safest thing it will certainly be more dangerous when this develops to the point where there are pirates on airships approaching other airships parachutes won't save them there hello I have a sensational discovery for you in the field of state building my late friend a professor left me his unique idea in your field here is my address write to me you won't regret it Mikhail we see it's indeed very nice that you can see us too you are from Novosibirsk right got it we will write the email as requested we have the email overall it ended up being two hours again even though we always aim for 40 minutes thank you for being here and for your interest in airships it means we are kindred spirits after all these are very cool sky whales we will definitely definitely succeed everything is prepared on our end now we need activity from your side it's not necessarily about being active I mean running or investing just tell people that airship construction has started in Russia this is just incredibly cool news that you really want to share we are preparing materials for you all sorts of different ones both video and presentation ones you see they are gradually being released there there are such webinars on Tuesdays and Fridays call them just say imagine airships will be flying soon you need to watch you need to observe and this is already a great help from your side so we are not saying goodbye see you on social media see you soon